So, amen. So here we are at the foot of the Lonely Mountain studying the book of John. What a great, what a great place to be. And um, we're in the heart of the gospel of John. Um, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This is just, this is really the meat where it's, if, if you had a big buffet, you're eating the steak now. Um, and we're going to take our time here. We're not going to rush through it uh, because there's just so much good stuff here to learn, so much good stuff to to, to realize. Um, and uh, so we'll pick up right after. Well, just for, as a reminder, you know, John 13, we were wrapping up. Jesus is talking about his death. And and Simon says, he's, you know, that's not going to happen. And and Jesus tells him that you will deny your you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. And that's the end of chapter 13. Now, keep in mind that chapters and verses were added later. They were not in the scriptures. They're not, in a sense, spirit inspired. So really, this continues. This is just a continuation, even the very next sentence. Um, so in John chapter 14, verse 1, uh, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And first of all, that ta- that tells you a boatload of information. Um, it tells you what the, the apostles are feeling is the discussion has gone to Jesus' death. And you can imagine, you know, I mean, they've been with Jesus for three years. He's mentioned it more than once. <laughs> He's talked about his death. He's talked about how it all will end. Um, I don't know if they were just in denial. They didn't want it to happen or, or they just really weren't paying attention, uh, you know, but either is possible. But all of a sudden this becomes very serious. Their hearts are troubled. They're the, you know, the word is a very strong word to be in anguish, to be, to be disturbed, to be frustrated, uh, uh, you know, very highly emotional. And he says, um, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And this is that same word that we're hearing all the time, pisteo, uh, to have faith. This is the word translated as faith, translated as trust, translated as belief. Um, and unfortunately, I think the the there's just no English word strong enough to convey what the idea of faith is. That's why I love the Hebrew word the most, emune, which is to trust, to rely on, to depend on, to put your hope in, to be loyal to. All that's wrapped up in this. And and probably one of the most significant things about, about translations is trying to keep the concepts, you know, not just trying to tell you what the word is, but to keep the concept behind the word. And, and the concept of faith is much bigger than just, uh, than just believing in something. Um, so I got a, I got a question here. Which scriptures were added later? What do you mean? They were not inspired scriptures. Did John not write them? Um, I don't think I meant anything wasn't inspired. Uh, it's all, this is all inspired. No, I didn't say scriptures. I said numbers, chapters and numbers. Those were added later. Um, but the scriptures are all inspired. So, uh, so, um, Jesus, you know, he's talking about, they have their faith in God to have their faith in him. And, you know, this is, I mean, this is the heart of our, of our religion. This is the heart of our Christianity that, that we have to trust God through it all, through what happens. I mean, you know, right now, this is, you know, with everything that has happened with the pandemic and life changing and people losing their jobs and, and, you know, friends and family of friends and family of family, uh, perishing, losing their lives. There's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anxiety out there. And this is where really, you know, your faith kind of in a sense hits the nitty gritty of, of not giving in to fear, not, not thinking about what could go wrong, but thinking about Jesus, thinking about God. I mean, this is the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. He's, he's, he is uh, pouring his heart out to them. They, I, I, you know, my, my hunch is they're getting that, okay, this is, this is the climax because simply the way Jesus is talking, the way he is, the way he's handling himself, 
Um, and he says, he says to them some words that are very special words. So he tells them, you believe in God, believe also in me. And he says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Now, here's a really cool thing about this. So he's telling them, you know, that that his father's house has many rooms. Now, that's that's even that is a very unique statement. I mean, heaven, obviously we're we're talking about heaven here, but he doesn't just uh it's not the typical phrase for heaven. You know, heaven's not usually called my father's house. He's using that term why? Because it's tying into wedding language. Um typically, you know, and weddings evolve, so it's not like there was one way to do a wedding and that was how they did it for a thousand years. Weddings evolved. But the general idea of what would be happening in this time period is the parents would make an agreement that, our, you know, my kid's going to marry your kid and, you know, this is how it's going to work out. And then, you know, at a certain point, the young man would go to her house and he would have a cup and he would he would propose and or he would give the dowry or whatever was agreed upon, and he would also have a cup and she would drink that cup, and that would be the sealing of covenant. And then he would tell her that he would go back to his family or his father's house, build them a house or build them a room, and then when it was done, he would come back with his groomsmen to pick her up. And and she would be, you know, in waiting until he came back and, and he would take her to go be with them. And the bride would go live with the groom's family. And that's that's how it worked. That's roughly how it all worked. There was, it was, as I said, it evolved, but that's the general idea. So we get an insight to what's going on here. And Jesus is basically, uh, basically committing to them his relationship to them. It's, it's almost like a proposal. It's a, it's a covenant, you know, that, that I will come back for you. We will be together forever. I mean, you know, people cry at weddings. Why? Because there's such powerful expressions of love, of devotion, of commitment, you know, and, and they read vows to each other and they make promises to one another. And sadly in the world, most weddings don't, you know, last. And, and you know, in the kingdom, we have, we have much better odds and uh, simply because of the help we have with Jesus and and the church, but 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 we love it when we know that the people are sincere, that they've prepared, that they're relying on God, because it's just the hope of forever, right? But but that was, that that expression of love, that expression of devotion, that expression of commitment is moving. It's 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 powerful. It's a, it's an incredible thing, and that's what Jesus is doing with them. I mean, it's it's kind of like this is the wedding day of the church. These are his. These are the foundlings. These are the early church members, the found the founders of the church, and he is betrothing himself to them, and the church will be his bride. So that's, and they would have known that. They would have totally known that. I mean, if 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 you sat down with somebody at a dinner table and you said, "I whatever your name is." Uh, commit to uh, to love you in sickness and health, in wealth and in poverty, in good times and bad times. They'd be like, "Wait, what are you doing? What are you doing here?" Because they would know immediately that you're making a commitment, that you're making a covenant, a wedding covenant with them. And that's basically what Jesus did. That's uh, is he makes that wedding covenant with them. He says. Um, and and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And okay, there's another one of those I am statements, right? Um, he uses the I am again. But um, but again, it's, it's, it's Jesus reassuring them. He's reassuring us. I mean, it's recorded because this promise is also for us that he will come back to be with us and he will come back and he will take us to be with him, with the father. 
in the Father's house. And of course, a lot has, has often been preached and talked about the room that he's got prepared for us, right? Um, you know, the the everybody loves to talk about that room. You know, what's my room going to look like in heaven? And I always joke about it, man. It's going to have a 200 by 200 inch flat screen TV. It's going to be four dimensionals. It's it's going to be all kinds of stuff. You know, what are four, what's the fourth dimension? I don't know, but we'll figure it out there. And, and it's going to be incredible. Uh, and, and he's making that commitment to them and saying, look, I'm going to come back and get you. Don't worry, basically. Don't be afraid. I will be back. And I will be back specifically for you to take you to be with the father in the father's house, in your room, you know, and it's, it's, it, I love that, that the, the promise and the clear uh, direction that Jesus is giving us, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to stay. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to start the church. And then I'm going to come back and take you to be with me. And and you got to love that. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we don't think about it enough. We don't think about heaven enough. We don't think about what Jesus is doing enough. And I think sometimes we're even kind of a, a, a little bit afraid to believe that it's too much pie in the sky or it sounds too good to be true. And, you know, that most things that sound too good to be true are too good to be true, but not so with Jesus. There isn't a promise that he made that he ever broke. There isn't a promise that he made that he will not fulfill in due time. And that is incredibly reassuring. Jesus is coming back for you. He's coming back to pick you up. I'll never forget a time one time and and um I my 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 parents had just separated and it was just my mom and I. And we were living in a house down in Imperial Beach, California, which is a little town, little beach town south of San Diego, and right on the border. And um, it was it was a scary time for us. It was just my mom and I, and we, you know, and uh, you know, it was, I was about twelve years old. Probably the worst time that you could be for parents to divorce and, and separate. And and um, and I remember my mom told me she was going to pick me up from school. We were going to go out to, I think it was called Farrell's or something like that. We are going to go out for an ice cream. And I waited after school and I was excited. And even though, you know, at that that's a funky age where you don't necessarily want to be with your parents. But, but I was excited about it. And she didn't show up. And I remember I walked home and I was so angry and I was so hurt, you know, and, 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 you know, it turns out it wasn't her fault. She had to, she had to work late and, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. So, so people just didn't show up and you had to find out later why. And, uh, and I was so hurt and I was so disappointed and, and it really hurt. And I was even kind of surprised at myself, how hurt and upset I was. And I, looking back, I realized it was just a very scary time in my life for me. And that, and I was just kind of clinging to our relationship. And I think about that, that's something what it must have been like for them to hear that Jesus was going to die, that he was going to leave. I mean, they'd spent three years with him. All their hopes were in him. All their, you know, their future was wrapped up in him. They'd left their business in Nazareth. They are in Capernaum. They they they'd left everything for him, and to hear that he's going to die would be very scary, and to hear that promise that he would come back for them would be so reassuring. And the thing about Jesus is he doesn't ever forget, and he doesn't ever not show up. And and how reassuring that would have to feel. And even though, I mean, we know we know what's going to happen is that they are going to get discouraged and they're going to go back home after he gets crucified. And that's kind of that time of disappointment. But here Jesus is telling us what he will fulfill and he fulfilled it with them. And guess what? He's going to fulfill it with you and me as well. He will come back to get you. He's chosen you. He's going to pick you up and he's not going to take you to Pharaoh's. He's going to take you to heaven that's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. You know, that, that, that this is the promise that he has made. You're in a covenant like a wedding. You know, you drank the cup, you drank it last Sunday. You drank it the Sunday before that you've drank it many, you've drank it, drunk it 
many, many times. And you've reassured and reaffirmed that commitment that you guys have to each other, that you and the Lord have to one another. And he says, you know the way and the place where I am going. Now, it's funny he says that because, again, sometimes Jesus says things just to challenge us, to really make us think it through. And I think that was one of those statements where he just, he wants them to think through, wait, what is exactly is he really talking about? It's, it's not talking about running to the store here. He's talking about something much bigger. And of course, Thomas, who, you know, Thomas, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And when he says the way, that that's a, you know, that's a key word. We've talked about that. The way is a key concept. It's one of those concepts that runs through the Old Testament and the New Testament, the way of the Lord. And he says, how do we know the way? How, how are we going to know how to follow you if you leave us? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And, you know, he states, he he reassures them again. You, you, know, you know the way. Come on. Sometimes we just don't, we don't want to recognize even what we know already, even what was already in us. He says, he first says, I am the way. Um, he's the path. How do you get to heaven? Well, through Jesus. He is the way. He teaches us how to get there. We just follow Jesus. That's it. We focus on and we follow Jesus. This is incredibly important because I think a lot of times we think, oh, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do that, I got to do all these things. What you need to do is just focus and follow Jesus. He's the way. He will get you there. Not, And it's not just a one-time deal. I think... Um, like a lot of religions, I think we fall into the same mistakes sometimes. We'll take a key point in the salvation process and we'll put everything there. You know, is it a bar mitzvah? Is it a christening? Is it a coming out? Is it a baptism? Obviously, baptism's a key point because we know from the scriptures your sins are forgiven and you're raised to live a new, a, live a new life. But it's certainly not the only point. I mean, you have to come to faith. At some point, you have to decide to believe in Jesus and put your faith in him. We have to repent of our sins. At some point in life, we have to realize what we've done wrong and repent and decide to live a righteous life. Even though we'll never be perfect, even though we'll never do everything right, but we have to make that decision to say goodbye to our sinful life and strive to live a righteous life, which is, practically speaking, following Jesus. And we get baptized, of course. And then after that, we come out and we're living a new life, following Jesus. But the thing that continues for our entire life is following Jesus. So that's the big thing, is he is the way. He's the way to get us to heaven. Because you can come to faith, repent, and be baptized. And if you're not following Jesus, it's no good. I mean, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10 talks all about that about trampling on the blood of Jesus all over again, about falling away. I mean, the book of Hebrews is basically a giant warning to don't fall away from what? Fall away from Jesus. Don't back away from Jesus. Don't 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 follow at such a distance as, as one, I heard one preacher say, we want to be close enough to the fire to fill its warmth, but not so close to get burned, you know? And, and we, you know, with Jesus, you got to be as close as you can. And he's never going to burn you, but you might suffer. And and you have to be as close as you can to Jesus. He says, I am the way and I am the truth. And he is the truth. And I think particularly in this day and age, it, it it's becoming more and more important because, you know, the postmodern world doesn't believe in truth, doesn't believe in absolute truth. Everything's fake. Everything's perspective. Everything is what you, according to what you feel. And one person's reality is just as important and just as real as another person's reality. And that's simply not reality. <laughs> the truth is there is a truth. There are things that are true, 
Not everything is subjective. And, but that's where we're at right now in terms of the, the general consciousness of mankind as it evolves at this moment doesn't believe in truth. And yet Jesus is the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. And, you know, and again, you know, I've already said it a lot of times, the difference between bios and zoe. And Jesus is promising zoe. He is promising what real life is about. Really the thing that everybody wants. Why do people work so hard so they can make good money? Why do they want good money so that they can pay for to have a a good house and a good car and and feel good about themselves and 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 really what to have a good life people chase things because they want a good life life to the full and the problem is is a nice car and a nice house doesn't necessarily give you a good life uh, lots of money doesn't necessarily give you a good life nice clothes doesn't necessarily good looks doesn't necessarily give you a good life being fit doesn't necessarily give you got lots of education doesn't even religion doesn't necessarily give you a good life jesus gives you a good life jesus provides soe following him is the good life that people don't realize it because it's not what they think and those are that's one of those secrets of the kingdom things that nobody else knows that they're looking in the wrong place There is a place where all that we really desire deep down is made possible. And that is in Jesus. Because really, ultimately, what matters? Well, I mean, there's there's books written on deathbed confessions and what people say on their deathbed. When, they, when it's all over, what do they say? What matters? That they worked longer? That they had more money in the bank? No. Their relationships. That they that they're close to the people they love, that they know God, they know Jesus, that they're not full of guilt. I just saw this special, this scientist doing all this research on death and what people feel and how people enter the state of death when they die, how they go through that process. And he said, the worst thing is people who are loaded with guilt because they fight and they struggle and they're tormented because they have all this guilt. In Jesus we're free of guilt. We're covered by his grace. We know we've striven to do our best. And even the mistakes we made and the things we did wrong, we know we're covered by grace. It's as though we did none of it. And God is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. And he says, if you really know me, then you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how many ways Jesus said it, but it was many, many ways that he said he is God. He and the Father are one and the same. They are connected. They're the same essence, the same substance, the same, uh, you know, every way. Now they are in two different forms. One is the form of the Son and one is the form of the Father. But he is the way for us to know the Father as well. And, and, what you want to know, I mean, I, you know, I've shared this before, especially in John 1, where he really explains this, of that, how does a finite mind conceive and understand an infinite being, a being who is omnipresent, omniscient, omniscient, who is, who is uh, outside of all the dimensions that we understand, who lives outside of our space and time continuum? How do we do that? We don't. We don't. It's too hard for us. And what we naturally do is try to shrink down God. And that's why we have statues and crosses and little things to try to make God understandable and something we can grasp and carry and have with us. And that is the problem with idols is is you end up shrinking God too small and your God is small and weak, not the God who can save you. But the, the only, the only, symbol, you could say, or the only shortcut that God provides is Jesus, that you can look at Jesus and know what God is like. What pleases God? What pleased Jesus? What what makes God angry? What made Jesus angry? What is it God really wants? Well, what did Jesus say? And how would, how would God handle life on earth? Well, we look at Jesus, and we know the answer to all those things. 
thank the Lord he sent Jesus to help us understand and to be that bridge to be to, to close that gap. So Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And, and he's talking about all the signs, all the things that he's done over time. Uh, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. You know, this is one of those statements that um, is interesting. You know, he says, he says, um, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And because Jesus is going to be in heaven, basically because he's leaving and the Holy Spirit's coming, greater things will happen. I mean, as, as, as I said at the very beginning, Jesus never left um, 30 miles in his entire adult life. He didn't leave more than 30 miles from, from Nazareth. I mean, he was basically in just a local region doing everything. He knew that the apostles and then the disciples of the apostles and the disciples of the disciples would spread the gospel all around the world. And they would see the world evangelized. Not any one of them, because global evangelism is bigger than any one person's life. And it's always funny. I had this guy was getting on me saying, you know, why don't you have the goal to evangelize the world in one generation? And, you know, and it's, it didn't happen in the first generation. Why would we think we're going to do better than Jesus and the apostles? I mean, it, they didn't evangelize the world in one generation. It took many generations. Now, what they did was great, was fantastic. They spread the gospel country to country, part of the world to part of the world. And it is spreading around the world to this day. It's still spreading around the world. And we're not, you know, this is, this is uh, the fact that we get to be part of this is what's so incredible about this. And he says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You know, and basically, again, all of this is Jesus saying, look, I'm with you. We're in a covenant. We're married. You know, when when uh, um, when nuns become nuns, <laughs> they put on a wedding dress and they go through a wedding ceremony because they are now wed to Jesus in, in, in a very symbolic, but they literally put on a wedding dress because they are now brides of Jesus. In a very real way, that's what the church is, the bride of Jesus, which means that's what you are. You are married to Jesus. You belong to him. You're his bride. We're his, we belong to him. We, we, we are in, much like we are in a covenant, if you're married and with your spouse, or if you're not married, doesn't matter, we're all in a covenant with Jesus. So we'll stop there. You know, the, the the first half of 14 basically is Jesus reaching out and assuring us that we're in this together. And because he's going to die and leave, don't worry, he's coming right back. He's going to take you to, to be with him in heaven. And he's promising that. I'll close with this story. Um, because I oftentimes think that we don't we don't think about heaven enough and we don't realize how great it is. And we ought to, because that would encourage us, I think, a lot. Um, there's a there's a classic story, this old couple, they they pass away, they're in a terrible car accident, they pass away, and the next thing you know, they're at the gates with Peter, and um and Peter says, I'm gonna take you for a tour. And and he takes them and shows them all around heaven. And uh, he says, he takes me to this huge mansion and and the old guy, you know, he's like, whoa, whoa, how much is this mansion going to cost? And Peter says, no, you don't understand. The mansion's free. Uh, all of this is free. He says, free? And he goes in, he looks around, he's amazed at the mansion in heaven that he's got. And he looks out the back, 
beautiful golf course. And he says, can we play there? And, 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 and he says, yeah, you can play there. And he goes, what are the green fees? And Peter says, uh, you're not getting this. This is heaven. This, there are no green fees. You can play anytime you want. And he says, let me take you to the, to the clubhouse. And they go down to the clubhouse, and he's looking around. He's amazed. It's a beautiful clubhouse. And there's this huge buffet of food. And uh, he says, let's eat, you know, and, and they start, he starts taking the, the bran muffins and the, you know, the, the margarine, no, cal- low, no cholesterol. And, and Peter says, you can eat whatever you want. And he says, what do you mean? And he says, it's free. This is heaven. And he says, I don't have to pay for the food. You don't have to pay for anything. All of it's free and you can eat whatever you want. And all of a sudden, the guy starts kicking the ground. And he's throwing things down. And he's yelling. And, and Peter looks at the wife and says, what's wrong with him? And, and she says, I don't know. And he says, doggone it. The husband says, doggone it, Ethel. If you hadn't been forcing me to eat all those bran muffins, I could have been here 20 years ago. Sometimes we avoid death because we're so scared of because we don't know what's going to happen afterwards. Heaven's going to happen. And that's going to be awesome. And that's what Jesus was promising them. Whatever happens in this world, don't worry. He's coming back to take you, to claim your room. And the fees, no fees. And you can eat whatever you want. God bless you, and we'll continue tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.